The following conversation is a interview that I had with Andrew Howley, the chief editor of Ask Nature of the Biomimicry Institute. So the Biomimicry Institute is the group responsible for the NASA BIDARA prompt. In this episode, we talk about uh, biomimicry as in the lens of systems thinking, and it was just a really fascinating conversation. It's difficult to encapsulate uh, everything about that call. So uh, please jump on in, and I hope you enjoy this episode of Systems Thinking with David Shapiro. But yeah, so um, well, thanks for reaching out. It's been a it's been a few weeks since um since the since I posted my video about the the Badara prompt. Um, but yeah, I, I guess just taking a step back, tell me a little bit about um, kind of your work and um, and you know kind of what led to where we are today. Sure. So I'm the chief editor for AskNature.org from the Biomimicry Institute, which has been around for uh, over 12 years, um, almost almost 15. Ask Nature itself, um, and it's uh, been a tool that anyone trying to look to nature to find inspiration to guide their human designs and activities uh, can come to to kind of understand deep biological information in really understandable um, language, you know, free of jargon and put into the context of you're specifically trying to learn how this is doing what it's doing, right? The function of everything that we see in nature, you know, what is actually getting accomplished here? If we're trying to accomplish something similar, can we use similar strategies to accomplish that? Right? So uh, kind of taking that lens and looking at, looking at the different aspects of nature and the functioning of, of different organisms and the systems within them and among them and using that to to inspire and guide human activity. So Ask Nature is a place where you can come to see all of that and it's grown hand by hand, piece by piece over the you know decade plus. Um, and it's about now about 2,000 pages of reference, uh, which is mm. great. That's a lot, but that's clearly nowhere near everything that humans know about the functioning of other organisms or about, you know, about the organisms themselves beyond what we already know and will know in the future or have known in the past and might not be um, pulled together into any kind of, you know, recently published uh, scientific research. So we have um, been working with a uh, team at NASA on the pedal team to find ways to help use uh, machine learning and AI tools to kind of learn what we're doing in biomimicry and maybe make that more accessible, more plentiful, you know, kind of whatever it could be. Um, and so we've been experimenting for a long time about different ways to employ this to help us do this work better. Yeah, no, that's excellent. I mean, from my own, taking so much inspiration from nature, um, whether it's, you know, uh, human cognition, psychology, you know, bits gleaned from neuroscience, um, you know, even working on language models with uh, mm -hmm. different kinds of memory, for instance, how do we approximate the functions of human memory? So, well, first, thanks for, for just sharing kind of the, that, that long history. Where are we in terms of it, like from your observation, you mm -hmm. know, obviously AI, uh, deep neural networks are nothing like human brains. There's just a, a few like basic principles that were taken <laughs> as inspiration, but we've been able to get some really profound performance yeah. by just kind of taking some of the ideas of creating, you know, feed forward networks that are able to discover uh, or, you know, derive their own circuitry. Um, you know, probabilistic networks, basically just lots of them and, and lots of, lots of matrix multiplication. But uh, aside from that, uh, obviously lots of, everyone is familiar with chat GPT today, but what other trends do you see in terms of biomimicry um, any, anywhere in the sciences, the humanities, yeah. politics, economics, anything like what, what are the big trends that you're seeing? Yeah. Kind of w within the context of AI and, and what it's enabling or. Biomimicry broadly. Yeah, and, biomimicry yeah. broadly is really at work at all dimensions and in all facets. Um, there's some really interesting work coming from a philosopher out of the UK called Henry Dix. And he's uh, looking at biomimicry as not just an approach for design, but as actually like philosophically robust. 
Um, mm. you know, even within the context of the environmental movement or the conservation movement or sustainability or circularity, there's all kinds of movements and efforts that people have and interests that we have to promote the natural world, to get humans into kind of a better balance with it. Um, but each of them is kind of uh, hyper-focused in some way and is hard to extrapolate out more broadly from can sometimes they can become mutually exclusive or contradictory or take you into places that you wouldn't necessarily want want the direction to go you know like you can just imagine you know when, if you're over um, focused on overpopulation and do you simply mm -hmm. want the extinction of the human race you know right <laughs> or the human species no the human species yep. don't you don't really want uh, to go there um, so so trying to find something he says that biomimicry really has that uh, a, a good strong core foundation because it's about how humans relate to the rest of the world. And since it has an understanding there of saying the way that we should relate to the world is the way that other things in the world relate to each other in kind of a harmonious um, and productive and life uh, promoting way, that really gives you a strong core and basis from which for, you can go in a lot of different directions. So that's kind of uh, been an interesting aspect of the work to kind of make sense of how it is that biomimicry is finding relevance in so many different dimensions. That makes uh, sense. So it could be, you know, on the very practical level of, uh, you know, really famous examples of like something becoming really aerodynamic by looking to the structure of, you know, like the shapes of birds and or um, you know, hydrodynamic by looking at sea creatures. There's really basic formal functional thing. And then there's stuff like you talked about machine learning is itself, you know, based on some very simple aspects of how um, how our own brains work or how neurons work, you know, in humans right. and in other, in other uh, animals or other living things. Um, and then there's kind of uh, societal things, right? There's, there's patterns that we can see of different species that live in different um, situations and have different kind of social behaviors or social patterns or structures that work that can be applied into different human contexts. So one of the things about humans is that we live in a million different situations. We live in different environments. We live in different densities. We live in different levels of connection to the people near us and people far from us. And there's different examples in animal societies that match all of those. And not that everyone can always guide us, but there's lots that you can learn by looking to some of these things. Right. How, how uh, you know, animal groups will make decisions, you know, kind of by voting, by kind of uh, expressing confidence in a particular leader for that moment, you know, or in uh, how how a succession of leadership uh, develops. There's all kinds of things. Um, and then there's systemic or a systems level uh, interests, such as how resources are distributed efficiently, efficiently in, say, uh, insect colonies or a famous one of slime mold, where it's just kind of growing and pulsing and growing and pulsing and finding uh, effective uh, venues for moving its own resources to get resources that are in uh, you know unpredictable locations um, and so it's it's really finding particular expressions in all sorts of different uh, fields and at different levels and all of it guided with this sense of by learning these things we can be doing the things that we do more harmoniously more uh, efficiently with less toxins with less harm to other species and ultimately in ways that are actually beneficial to others and, and help to create a mm -hmm. world that is more abundant as opposed to more restricted. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Just listening to the, like I jotted down a couple of notes, like obviously engineering problems, whether it's, you know, deep neural networks or hydrodynamics, that's one set of one class of like biomimetics uh, or, or bio, uh, bio inspired, you know, uh, domain of, of problems and solutions. And then it was interesting to talk about social structures and patterns. I want to come back to that because I've actually had some ideas that I don't know how to reconcile with, because as you mentioned, you can take some ideas to a very like bad place. Like uh, uh, eugenics is an example of like, Oh, this is inspired by, you know, survival of the fittest. So let's do it on purpose. And it's like, that went horribly sideways. Um, so maybe we can come back to that in terms of like talking about things that can go wrong. Yeah. Um, but then principles and systems, I was thinking about how 
uh, circular economies mm -hmm. are uh, kind of really popular right now. Um, you know, farm to table and and these sorts of things. And to me, it's like, well, if you study ecology, it's just you know the trophic cycle, <laughs> right? It's yeah. just it's just it's just a, a local trophic cycle of producers and consumers and decomposers, and you just you build that as a system. So is that would you would you classify circular economies as, as fundamentally biomimetic, or is that an area of research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's uh, kind of the the more deeply you think about it, the more robust it becomes. So one of the um, ways that it can be a little shallower and less effective is if um, you imagine just creating something unsustainably and then having it circularly be used over and over, right? You know, circularly, that, that's hard. Have it circularly be used over and over. Um, whereas you took something out, you made something not great, you used it for a really long time through many different cycles. That's good. That's circular to a degree. But then there's much more robust ways that you can do it. You can look at, you know, what is the full life cycle of all of the materials there. One of the mm -hmm. things that we're looking at as an institute um, is decomposition, right? The role that decomposition plays in naturally circular environments where things aren't just reused wholesale, but can be broken down into the, you know, minute smithereens and made into entirely new structures, right? So you do have that in nature where, you know, an old tree becomes uh, hollowed out and provides uh, shelter for succeeding generations of, of rodents and birds and bugs and uh, things like that. But it's also that wood is getting broken down and used as food and then that uh food is being you know excreted and then that's you know helping to deteriorate the the wood and then that's providing food for fungus and fungus is breaking down the wood and it's happening at all those levels it is both drilling a hole into the trunk where a woodpecker can live and it is breaking down the material of the cellulose to mm -hmm. build some new fungus right yep and so trying to take that level of detail and that level of multi-tiered um, activity and apply that into the circular economy and circular structures and see that it's it's less of one circle and more of this whole complex web of tiny right. circles, tiny little Many flywheels. <laughs> nested loops, yeah. yeah. Well, obviously, I guess the, the biggest general principle is like, uh, study and imitate nature. That's kind of the right. that's that's the whole purpose of biomimicry. But with like in terms of discovering these these insights, uh, such as circular economies or um, you know following some engineering uh, examples, are there other like general principles that that apply very broadly, or either globally, universally, or within specific domains? that like you've discovered over the last 12 to 15 years? Yeah, I think the, the biggest uh, takeaway seems to be kind of the starting point that we talk about in biomimicry and certainly on Ask Nature, this is the way that we've structured the website, is to look at function, right? So mm -hmm. not just a description of what the organism is doing, but what is it accomplishing? And when you think of that at different scales and in different ways and think of your own uh, challenges that you're trying to solve or address, that's where you find the ends to, uh, to effective emulation in nature. So, you know, it starts out, you know, maybe someone says, wow, I really wish there was a better car. Maybe we could do something different than the internal combustion engine fueled by gasoline. Right. right. So you say, okay, so I want something like gasoline that's, that's different. Something that functions the same as gasoline, right. That it can, you know, be ignited and the, the steam and the heat can drive pistons, you know, um, the way the internal combustion engine works. That's, that's one level of thinking about the function. You're thinking, what is the gasoline? Because I substitute something that has a similar function in nature. But maybe it's that the engine itself, just that idea, you're, you actually would just want to spin these wheels. Maybe there's something else that functions in nature right. that can spin these wheels. Or maybe the real function that you're try, trying to do is move people or objects from place to place maybe cars aren't the thing at all and how does how does nature find other ways to perform that function and so right. um, when you break it down to what is the ultimate function that i'm trying to perform that's where you get those real insights and where you can kind of 
hone your your efforts you know if you're a chemist if you're you know like a chemical engineer then you're going to want to be thinking about it at those levels of like this substance is doing that and what kind of substances in nature might be more uh uh naturally beneficial or less toxic or easier to produce in a natural environment um you know so, so you can kind of angle your or you know focus your questions on the domains in which you are best prepared to act first thank thank you for all that there's two follow-ups that i want to do and and the first one might be simpler and that's to ask about energy because we talked about material and function mm -hmm. and i'm curious about how energy might serve as a third pillar but then then a larger topic and i just want to say this is is um i'm actually writing a book on systems thinking and i'm as i'm oh, listening cool. to you i'm realizing that that everything that you're talking about is 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 systems thinking because you're talking about like different layers of abstraction of function like you know do you do you just need to replace the fuel do you replace the motor do you replace the car or what 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 even is the greater function and in, in, in embeddedness at different levels of like maybe do you need a car at all maybe perhaps you know another yeah, mode right. of transportation <laughs> is appropriate or maybe you can create a system where where transportation isn't even necessary like a walkable city as an example of like just subvert the original need in order mm -hmm. to bring these cycles closer together so i want to talk about systems thinking more broadly but before we get into that because we talked about you know matter the material that goes into like the tree and uh, or food or you know glass or whatever all those materials can can be part of cycles but what about and, and then you talked at length about function like what is what is the output or what is it what is the achievement but what about energy how does energy figure into these cycles cuz like and here's here's the context of what i'm thinking of was i watched a documentary recently about how uh, logistics is the primary technology that really changed human society and civilization hmm. because until modern transit the best way to move any amount of goods and service or, or people was like boats right because overland transit was very slow very expensive and with trains it's it's you know many orders of magnitude more uh, faster and more efficient but even still like trains planes and boats um, they still have limitations and you know, uh, part of circular economies, part of farm to table, is reducing the energy input to to achieve you know moving people or food or whatever producing food. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious more broadly, how does energy figure into biomimicry um, and and any principles or examples that you have there? Yeah, that's it's definitely huge. So I don't think there's any way that I'll I'll capture everything or, or express everything. But some of the stuff that has been kind of bubbling up you know, in my work recently, and that's been seeming to resonate, is a realization that nature and biological systems aren't always hyper efficient. You know, there can be a lot of wasted energy, and mm -hmm. that it's handled at scales. And with with energy that is available enough, that that's not a problem, almost. So like, solar energy, you know, how does a tree build itself, right? It's like, it's just solar energy, you know, and it's absorbing the carbon from the air. It's getting some nutrients and water from the roots, um, which is powered by the sun. Very little of that energy actually goes into making the thing, right? There's a lot right. of loss, mm -hmm. but it's not like pollution loss. It's not material loss, and it's not um, wasting something that was hard for it to get. Right. So, mm. so that seems to be, one aspect of it of being like well if you if you can be harvesting you know from the sun or the wind or the water or you know even by burning other things if there's not a lot of negative coming from it then it doesn't have to be the most hyper efficient as long as it's not doing harm um, so right. that's that's kind of one aspect that's that seemed interesting and also the vast scales of energy that are uh that are at work, like you know, all of our living systems is, you know, like ATP and ADP, right? These little molecular bonds forming and unforming. And this is the energy that drives the functioning of our cells. It's all concentrated in our mitochondria. And there's just like phenomenal uh, statistics about how much energy that is or what scale of energy is released um, during th those actions. And it's like lightning bolt level energy, just at a molecular level right. and dispersed and, and desynced. So there, there's something I think powerful 
in, in that lesson, you know, where we tend to get very wide eyed and think of like, well, fission, if we could just split the nucleus of the atom, right? If we could just fuse the nucleus of it, um, that there's these vast quantities at a large scale and things. But there's also, it's also clear that you can take very tiny um, molecular energy, energetic bonds, and kind of harness those in ways that's using vast amounts of energy, but in really, you know, effective ways that are that are manageable, that aren't dangerous, that are um, accessible in all kinds of different conditions. Um, so that uh, that's that's some of the stuff that I think has been kind of bubbling up is that nature is using energy in a lot of different ways, and again at really different scales. That mm. um, and that each of those scales is nested, as you were saying, and and they're not happening separate from each other. And so you find ways to tweak and, and harness them and you can move things in really different uh, scales and dimensions. I like that. And, and it, it is, it is interesting because you're, you're right. Like I think the, the efficiency of, of photosynthesis is way less than 1%. And I think it's a fraction, tiny fraction of a percent. Yeah. Um, but if trees absorbed all of that energy, like I just a brief thought experiment, how much colder would a forest be? Like you need that ambient yeah. heat energy, <laughs> right? Like so, so yeah. even even if it's not making use of it all, like mm -hmm. the, the conversion rate might not be good from an engineering perspective, but from an ecological perspective, that energy is still it's still there and still yeah right. And we just energy. don't even know. We don't even right. know what, where that energy is going. We, right, we, we, right. We really don't. You know, you could say, yeah. oh, this is bouncing off here. This is getting in there. Okay. Yep. And all of that. But you know, there's there's the tension because uh, the 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 temperature of the Earth at that you know mm -hmm. it's just below surface is about 50, 54, 53 degrees depending on, and so you've got you know, a temperature gradient there, which is probably being used for some kind of uh, of uh, of uh, metabolism, mm -hmm. and then of course you got albedo, so you're losing what twenty to thirty percent of energy just to the sky. Mm -hmm. So then, like it, you're right, it is going all kinds of different directions, and there's all kinds of gradients. Um, but it's interesting to 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 think about it differently, rather than like yes, it's loss, but it's not necessarily waste, and it's also not necessarily polluting either. So yeah. just because it's low efficient or, or low efficient, it actually might that might be a path towards net effect a very high efficiency is just allowing that ambient energy to be used in other ways mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. like that well i have a little bit of time but if you're if you're out of time i can kind of oh yeah i do actually have to stop at uh okay so. well in that case i won't ask about system thinking more broadly we can just close out by talking about uh by dara and ai yeah. and kind of the the biomimetics of because one thing that I tell people often is, you know, the human brain is remarkably efficient with, with the amount of calculations that it's able to achieve with three pounds and 20 watts of energy. Now, obviously, we, we, we don't even know exactly how many calculations it's doing, because <laughs> every time we make an estimate, we, we're several orders of magnitude off a decade later. Um, so there's, there's that angle, but then also, um, you know, creating Badara and, and, and using it and and those sorts of things. So yeah, either either way, whichever whichever direction you want to go. Sure. Uh, the the first thought. is very heady and cool, and and I'm not even equipped to to go there. So I, that's fascinating, and I love that. I think yeah. one of the things that we find is every every new thing that we discover scientifically, lo and behold, we find already being utilized in biological organisms. Like that, mm -hmm. everything is happening. I mean, like. The gecko feed is a classic example of uh, of biomimicry, right? Like, oh, gecko geckos can climb up walls and across ceilings. Well, they've got these ridges on the on their toes. Well, the the ridges are covered in these tiny setae, like little, you know, like kind of tender like hairs. And then, oh, but the ends of those actually branch off. Actually, the ends of those uh, branch off. Actually, when push comes to shove, literally, it's the it's like the molecular bonds called the van der Waals attraction, right? And it's yep. like, come on, it's like how many you know things are going on? It's like we knew nothing about that. You know, like no no one consciously understood anything about that when geckos were developing this and living this way for millions of years. Um and sure enough, we learn about that stuff and then we find it reflected. And sometimes we find it because or, or we learn about it because we find it reflected in nature and we make sense of it. But you know, like even even quantum stuff and just the, the way the way that nature works at fundamental levels is just the way that it works. And so that is being reflected. And that's what 
um, what matter is, how matter is interacting, how energy is interacting, and then life is just accumulations of matter and energy, you know, and interactions there. So it's all it's all reflected there. So that kind of orders of magnitude of comp of uh, calculations in our brain, and just learning that ev every time we dig deeper, we find more. I think that's it's always going to go that way. We're going to find yeah. I, I love that. Well, because because we might find new ways that matter and energy are calculating in our brain, and then say, "Oh, yeah. we were off by another order of magnitude, or three, <laughs> yeah. depending on depending on how the information is processed or transmitted." Or because, like right now, one of the big things in neuroscience—I don't don't know if you're aware of this—and I'm barely aware of this—but um, is like the is the the way that electromagnetic waves propagate across the brain and actually serve uh -huh. as kind of an orchestration. Mm -hmm. Component and so like there's this there's this electric field theory that is being developed and uh, some of it still is is treated as very fringe. I don't know whether or not it is yeah. fringe, but it's an interesting. It's another layer of information processing that could be happening in the brain that we're not we're only just beginning to be aware of. So I, I yeah. like that insight that that and yes, yeah, so like geckos. I, I'm familiar with with that. Like they actually have to they have to peel their toes off backwards. They have to like right. because this, they're so sticky, they couldn't just pull it straight off. Right, and it's specifically designed at, at, at or you know at, at certain angles, the way the things branch off, so that it yep. all interacts. It's amazing. Yep. Oh yeah, I, I'll try to say something since we were talking specifically about Badar and the things that we were doing uh, uh, there. You know, biomimicry is all about looking to nature and using our human ingenuity to learn from that and apply it in new ways. Um, AI is just one more tool that we can mm -hmm. use, like any other number of tools, and they can be used biomimetically or not, right? And we've been you know, trying to find ways that it's clearly a powerful tool. It's got pros and cons. Well, so does every tool, because if you pick up a hand ax made of stone millions of years ago, the wrong way, you'll cut your hands. So. <laughs> Yes. Right? It's like there's there's pros and cons to every tool. You have to know how to use them. And yep. as long as you use them the right way, they're not dangerous. If you use them the wrong way, they are. Um, yeah. So we're, we're trying to take that kind of approach to it and explore it, investigate it. That's what nature has made humans particularly good at. Exploring, investigating, testing, playing with, um, and trying to find ways to, to use that in ways that will be good and beneficial for humans and to help us to be in better harmony with the rest of the world around us. Excellent. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to close out. So I will thank you for your time. And um, yeah, would love to talk again in the future. And um, I'll let you go and uh, to your to your next meeting. So thanks so much. And have a good day. Thanks a lot, Dave. Really great to talk to you. Uh, happy to be connected and, and look forward to talking again in the future. Cheers. Okay, take care.